Hi guys, um, welcome back. We are here with David Mulek, uh, the creator of uh, Heroes Free and many other very cool games, um, the director of development, legendary game designer, and hi David. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing great. What have you prepared oh, for us today? Well, uh, what I prepared is, uh, I was asked to give an inspirational talk about game design. So I, I don't know how inspiring I am, but what I thought I'd do is, is uh, talk about various lessons I've learned uh, throughout my career. So I'm going to be talking about kind of my own personal journey in game development and little lessons I learned along the way that, that hopefully that other people uh, can learn from and take advantage of. Great. I can't wait to hear it. Let's get to it. Good luck. All right. On air. Well, most of you know that uh, that know me as Sir Mullick from uh, from Heroes of Mind Magic Three and 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 later Heroes of Mind Magic games. Uh, I'm a I'm a game designer and game producer, and I've worked on a, a number of different games, including Dizzy's Ducktales, uh, I've No Mouth and No Scream with Harlan Ellison. Uh, let's see, Vampire the Masquerade, Bloodlines, and and a number of other games. So what I thought I'd talk to you about again is, is the journey that I took doing all these things. Now, I don't have any slides uh, for you. Uh, so it's, it's mostly gonna be me storytelling. And if, if that's something that, that interests you, that's great. Uh, and then at the, at the end, I'll uh, gonna have a couple of announcements that, that will probably be of interest to you as well as, uh, as, uh, as uh, answer some questions from you. So, uh, my first lesson is always be creating, A, B, C. Always be creating no matter what you do. Now, we're all gamers. We got into this because we love playing games. And when I was young, there weren't much in the way of video games. Mostly what I played were board games. And we, we had a closet that was just full of just about every board game there was out there. And my brothers and I would, would play board games with each other all the time. But eventually, I wasn't satisfied with just playing other people's games. I would start creating my own board games. And so that, that was kind of my first steps into getting involved in game development was, was, was getting out paper and, and drawing, drawing the, the pathways on it and getting down dice and creating my own board games. But my own creative desires branched out from there. I would, uh, I would write my own stories. I was a huge Star Trek fan at the time and still am. Uh, so I created my own Star Trek stories and I even took my dad's Super 8 millimeter uh, film camera and create my own Star Trek movies, even going doing my own special effects by, by going through uh, the film hand by hand and speaking uh, with a marker pen to create laser effects on it and transporter effects and such. Uh, but from, but it was, it was beyond, beyond just doing that, uh, I, was, I was very much interested in theater. I was in a theater major when I was a uh, when I was in junior high school, and then growing up throughout throughout uh, my childhood, I would I would put on puppet shows and do magic shows. In fact, I have a trick here. I'm still interested in magic, and I'll show you one of the tricks that, that I still do. Um, I'm uh, for my uh, my my birthday party a couple of years ago. Uh, I was, uh, it was my 60th birthday party. Most people don't, don't believe that I'm that old, but uh, I, I am. And so I, uh, for my party, we, we had a professional magician came by, but I started off doing some of the magic tricks I did when I, I was young. Uh, and, and here's one of them that I adapted to modern times. And this trick, well, it starts off with a story of how I was visiting my doctor's office and my doctor, as I was telling him, uh, he was asking me about myself and I told him I was six years old and he couldn't believe that I was th that old. And uh, so anyway, here I am, th th this, this wooden block represents me, solid wooden block. So I go into the doctor's office and I tell him, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling fine, I'm 60 years old, I don't have any ailments. And my doctor says, oh really? Well, what I want you to do, come with me. I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna go and take you and bring you into the waiting room. So he goes and brings me over to the waiting room and then puts me in and slams the door shut. And then what he does, he goes out and he takes a wooden stake and he goes, 
I know, the only way for you to look this young and be as old as you are is if you're a vampire. And so he went and he took the stake and he went and he put it right through my heart. And, uh, oh, this doesn't show too well in the virtual background. But anyway, he put a stake right through my heart. And uh, I suddenly panicked because, I mean, I, I live in the United States. We don't have we don't have universal health coverage. And my health insurance didn't cover this. So I had to get out of there. And I quickly went and it quickly got out and uh, escaped away from him. So that, that that's that's an example of I did have a magic trip. And the reason why I showed it to you, it kind of shows my approach to game design. The trick itself is just simply being able to have this block that's able to get past this, this wooden pencil in the way. But uh, I, I surrounded it with a story. And that's always been my interest is in different ways of storytelling. And I've done that all throughout my career. When I did board games, it was to tell a story, writing, sto writing uh, stories and uh, short stories and, and making films and such. Uh, even when I would, I would do a lot of drawings, uh, I would draw a lot of characters from Lord of the Rings and eventually branched out and doing my own, my own characters and doing my own, uh, my own little scenarios. And even through my drawing, I would do storytelling. Uh, so always different ways of storytelling was what motivated me. And all through all of my creation, all my creative uh, uh, creations were, were through storytelling. And where, uh, when I went into college though, I couldn't decide what outlet I wanted to take for, as, as, as an outlet for my, my cre creative uh, instincts. Uh, and I, I really couldn't decide whether to be a writer, a filmmaker, or a, uh, or a uh, artist. And so I could never decide what to do. And often when, when I can't decide what to do, uh, I, would, I would consult my magic eight ball to tell me, I'd say, what should I major in in college? And I'd go and look at it and it said, outlook not clear, ask again later. Okay, great. I, 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 I had a hard time deciding what to do. So what I, I, I went to, I kind of le lent toward filmmaking. And so when I went to pre-register for the radio television film department, uh, I, uh, I saw a long line around the, the, uh, the administration building of hundreds and hundreds of people who, were, uh, who wanted to uh, sign up uh, to pre-register to, to be filmmakers. And I thought there's no way all these people are going to find jobs in the film industry. And that's kind of where it, I don't know if I made a mistake or not, but but eventually I learned from there is that really you should try to follow your passion no matter what the odds. I I decided at the time to uh, to uh, just take a whole bunch of different classes in college and try to figure out something a little bit more practical to uh, to major in. And so because I was a big science fiction fan, I decided to take and I, I like robots and, and computers that I saw in science fiction stories. Uh, I decided to uh, take an introductory course in programming. And at first, I, I really didn't understand it all because I, I was a creator and I didn't understand the logical steps of, of uh, how a computer works. I didn't understand how it thought until maybe about a couple of weeks in, into the class when suddenly it all kind of clicked in. And uh, I really, really got what programming was all about and, and the way computers work. And then one day when I was sitting in the class computer lab, waiting or waiting to use the printer to print out my homework assignment, and there was a whole line of people waiting in front of me, I started typing out a Star Trek game. And as I was doing it, I kind of realized that being the player of the game, you're sort of like the lead character in a story. And what was different about any other story medium that interests me whether it was a film or reading a story or being in a play. The big difference is that in a game, your players are co-creating the story with you. They're the ones who are deciding what actions to take. And because they decide what actions to take, they determine the outcome of the story. And that notion really excited me. And so what I did is uh, I, I got excited about the idea of interactive fiction where where if, where the story unfolded based upon the player's choices. 
And so I, I immediately went up and changed my major to computer science uh, and started pursuing that. So it took me a while. I eventually did find, find, found, found my passion. At first, doing filmmaking, where I thought was my passion. Uh, I allowed the, uh, the odds against me to dissuade me. But here I was. Uh, and at the time, there was really no, there was really not, there weren't any computer games. This was before there were home computers. Really, the only games out there were arcade games. But I, I didn't even think about that. I didn't think about the practical practicality of me getting a job doing what I really wanted to do, which was interactive storytelling. I pursued it anyway. And I was glad I did uh, because about a year later, uh, I, was, uh, I was taking a, a business programming course. And uh, in addition to doing my homework for it, I was using the university computer to do things like print out pictures of the Starship Enterprise or to generate poetry. And, uh, and uh, wh one day, uh, as a, my, uh, my COBOL, uh, which is a business uh, language computer or common business oriented language, my COBOL professor called me to his office and said, uh, yeah, I saw what you were doing with a university computer. And uh, what do you guys think happened next? I thought I was going to I was going to get in trouble. Instead, what he did was offer me a job. He and a couple of the other professors in my college had opened up one of the first computer stores to open up in Los Angeles. And uh, he just he noticed that the creative things I was doing on the computer and that in his eyes made me special enough that he wanted to hire me to be an employee. So what I learned from that is always what you're doing, try to stand out from the crowd. And it's this is as important today as it was way back in when I first started uh, started out. In fact, even more important now, because for every game job that's out there right now, there's probably a hundred different applicants for it. Really tough to get a job in the game industry. And if you're creating an indie game on your yourself, you know, with your own initiative, having your game stand out is really tough. So what you always have to do is find some way to get noticed, find some way to, to get people to notice you and not notice everyone else who's out there. And that's what I, I kind of did it inadvertently. Sometimes you have to take risks in doing it, but yeah, you have to find some way to get yourself noticed and uh, get yourself, uh, uh, get yourself to, to, to get paid attention to more so than, than the other people out there. So the way it worked out for me is I got my job in this first computer store. And uh, so it was, it sold, this was in the year 1978, 79, I think it was. And the store sold some of the very first Apple computers. And at the time, there weren't much in the way of published games. In fact, what would happen is uh, we would sell computers to people and uh, mostly bought by hobbyists. And they brought them home and they had to figure out what to do with them. And a lot of them wound up writing their own software, writing checkbook programs and writing, uh, writing, uh, 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 even writing word processors and, of course, writing games. And so the company set up, uh, our, our store set up a side business selling some of our customer software. Uh, and uh, we, we sold it through a catalog. Well, a couple of the, eventually, some of the very first uh, software publishing companies formed. Sorry, my just got to notice my computer is running out of power, and that's because I dislodged the uh, dislodged the power supply. Just fixed it right now. All right, so some a uh, couple people uh, early on started this saw business in in selling software to other people because of the 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 hardware companies weren't so, weren't uh, 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 supplying uh, software, and so. Um, uh, and a lot of these these uh, first software publishers came to our store to buy their computers for their companies, and one of them was a was a was a gentleman by the name of Sherwin Steffen, who had worked uh, at uh, UCLA, uh, the University of, of California, Los Angeles. He he had recently been laid off from the uh, educational television department in Washington and decided to to set up his own business, his own company called Eduware. Mostly to sell educational software, but but he also saw the uh, the uh, advantage in selling games, 
And so what he did was he asked me if I'd be interested in creating some games to sell through his store. So what do you think I said? I said, of course, you bet I'd, I'd love doing it. So while I was going to college, I would spend my spare time creating my own games uh, that I would I, that I would write in basic, beginner's all-purpose symbolic instruction code, one of the very earliest game languages that uh, programming languages that came on uh, some of the first computers. And uh, so in deciding what type of games that I wanted to write, uh, uh, I had to think about um, really what it is that I, that I know. And, uh, and so what I would do is focus on, uh, what I did was I would, I would go and, uh, and uh, write games based upon things that I was learning about in school. So I was taking a, a archeology span class. And so as a result, the very first game I wrote for, uh, for uh, his company, Edgeware, was a, uh, was a text-based space role-playing game called Space. And uh, it was actually, a, it was actually a, a follow-up module to, to a, a role-playing game they had already created. He, had, he asked me to write a, some new modules for it. And so I, I created a game based upon going out and and uh, uh, getting to new planets, and you were a shaman trying to re gain religious converts, and that was all based upon what I learned about comparative religions in college. So that uh, the, the that module was called Shaman, and that was my very first game that I made professionally. And then came the uh, the following year came the uh, the uh, oil crisis that we had in the United States, where uh, where there was a shortage of oil, and uh, so gasoline got very expensive, and there were there were long lines at the gas stations to get oil. So what I decided to do was make an economic simulation game based upon uh, what I was learning in an economics class, and that was uh, that was called Windfall Fall an Oil Crisis Simulation, and then I followed that up with a uh, a uh, game based upon what I was learning in a mass media cl class, which was all uh, all about, the class was all about learning about how the film and television industry worked. So I created a game that that uh, called Network, where you would have television shows uh, that uh, were pitched to you, and you had to decide which ones you wanted to put in your schedule and figure out the, the best order in which to put them to lead one audience from one into the other and build up the best audience throughout the evening. Uh, so a couple of things that I learned from this experience early on was not only should you stand in with the stand out from the crowd, you have to get in with the right crowd. And I would not have gotten a job in the game industry, especially with something that was that small and that niche at the time, if I hadn't been in the right place, if I hadn't worked at Rainbow Computing. So these days, there's actually a lot of opportunities for you to be in the right place and meet other game development people for those opportunities. Because I would say at least 80% of all jobs in the game industry are not gotten by going onto a company's website and, and finding out what jobs they're pitching and, and applying for those jobs. It's finding out from friends or other people that work in the game industry what jobs uh, are out there and, and, what, and getting recommended for those jobs. Uh, again, most of the jobs I've gotten were from because either someone told me about a job opening that wasn't advertised or that I might otherwise have, uh, have missed or because somebody recommended me to someone else who was looking to fill a position. So these days, what you, what you all should be doing, if you're not already, is being very active on social media. You should all be having Twitter accounts. You should be writing blogs. If you're an artist, posting art to DeviantArt and elsewhere uh, and getting your, your name out there, putting out your thoughts, um, putting out demos of your work. You certainly should have a, a, a website, a portfolio website showing off all of your work, um, samples of your work to everyone. I also recommend that you join the IGDA, the International Game Developers Association, uh, which is Worldwide Organization of Game Developers. It is 
and 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 there are city there there are chapters in in many cities throughout the entire world. Uh, I just helped open up a chapter in uh, Minsk uh, with my friends who are who uh, live in that city, uh, and uh, that's a great place to go and meet other people who are in the community with you. So you can either find out about jobs that are available, or maybe get together with some of your other game developer friends and start up. Uh, get together and form your own teams and and start it up. Uh, your own uh, uh, game uh, game teams and, and develop your own games. And you certainly should take advantage of uh, uh, event tools, uh, event websites like Eventbrite and Meetup.com to find out uh, about other meetings of game developers that are out there so you can go in and, and meet people that are similar interests because uh, because you really need to know other people in the game industry if you want to be uh, part of the people that are that are out there to get jobs. In fact, uh, one of the things that, that I recommended to somebody who was a, a starting game producer uh, who uh, I met at a uh, IGDA party at uh, E3, the Electronic Entertainment Expo, uh, he came up to me and said, what advice do you have for me for someone starting out to uh, to get it, get find, find better jobs in the game industry? And I told him, meet as many people in the game industry as you can. In fact, I'm going to give you an assignment right now. What I want you to do is go out in this party, meet 10 different people and bring me back their business cards at the end. And uh, when uh, uh, maybe about half hour later, he came out. And he showed me 10 different business cards of 10 new people he had met. And so that's a, that, that's a really important skill to learn. I know a lot of us who work in the game industry are introverts. You know, we don't like talking to other people. We'd much rather sit in front of the computer uh, all day long. But it's, it's still really important uh, that you go out and meet other people. thing about introverts, it's not necessarily that we don't like people. In fact, I'm an introvert that loves other people. It's just that it's tiring for us. Whereas extroverts get their energy from being around other people. For us as introverts, being with other people drains us of energy. But you know, you build up your energy ahead of time, you can go into a conference, you can go into a meeting, you can go into an industry party and use your energy to go out and meet other people and introduce yourself and get to know other people. Uh, so may, make time to go out and meet other people uh, out there in the industry. You, you, you use events like this, online events, meet other people online if that's what's more convenient for you. And certainly that's that's how we should be meeting people while the uh, while the uh, coronavirus epidemic is, is still occurring. Uh, but uh, when you do uh, eventually get out there, make sure you have business cards with a link to your portfolio site on there. So go out there and get in with the rest of the game development crowd. And then figure out what it is that you know, your own unique skills and your interests, uh, and go out and uh, and uh, uh, thinking about what what is it about you that's unique and that you know that uh, that uh, you can go out and share with other people. Now this is a game design track, so it mostly focuses on game designers. Thing about game designers. You can, uh, the way you can tell game designers is from looking at their bookshelf. So whereas with programmers, typically you're gonna find a lot of books in their bookshelves about programming or about mathematics. Artists, you're gonna find a lot of books about art. Game designers, their bookshelves are filled with books about everything. We've got books about cinema. We got books about history. We have books about literature and philosophy and you name it because anything just about any topic can be the basis for a game we, a game designer should have all sorts of different topics at their disposal interests at their disposal uh, for their uh, uh, that they can draw inspiration from because you, you never know where you, you can draw it from uh, I think that uh, as much time as we spend working on games and playing games, it's good for a game designer. In fact, good for anyone to be develop other types of interests. I mean, you should be going out there. You should be, you know, when it's safe to do so, going out there and and attending plays and listening to music, going to concerts and going to museums 
and uh, going out and, and, ex and experiencing the wilderness and, and going out camping or hiking or whatever, exploring your own city, exploring other people's cities out there. Because the more you know, the more experiences that you have, the more that you will be able to draw from. Uh, so game designers are, are often influenced by their personal interests and you never know what kind of interests you have that can, that can go and apply that you could eventually use to turn into a really interesting game design. And if you have a lot of different interests and a lot of unusual interests, you can bring more unique elements to your own game design. So I encourage everyone here, be, become very well-rounded people and develop a lot of interests that you can go and share about someone else. But that also applies to doing research in your games, not just about topics. Uh, a successful game designer really has good research skills. So when you're, when you're working on a game, even beyond researching the content, what you should be doing is researching the competition. You should be looking at other, when you're developing a game, you should be looking at other, other games out there that are similar and figure out what's fun about those games, what made them successful, but also what made them unsuccessful. What's not fun about that experience? And in fact, this, this leads me to uh, another uh, important lesson that I've learned from ga uh, developing games. And that is really what you should be focusing on is the player experience. What experience do you want to have the player to have while they're playing the game? And it's not just what, what you want them to learn, but how you want them to feel. And the way I, I liken game design, what I like in game design too, it's a lot of ways, it's like throwing a party. So when you're throwing a party from your, for your friends, what you have to do is as a party host, you may figure out what the theme of the party is and coming up with the right theme is really important because you want a theme that, that other people are, that your friends are gonna be interested in and will lead to a fun experience. So that theme can lead you to what kind of decorations you're gonna have, what kind of food you're gonna serve, uh, what kind of music you're gonna play, what kind of activities you're gonna do. Uh, you know, having a good party comes about from successful planning uh, and have everything really work together. And then what you do is you, you invite your friends over and your job is to make sure that your friends at your party, everyone is there to have a good time. Um, so that's, that's what it's like being a game designer. Your job as a game designer is to make sure that your players are going to have a good time. Uh, what you are is an advocate for the player. And always throughout, that, that's your job all throughout game development. You should constantly be thinking about what, is, what type of fun do I want to have my player to have through this, through this game? based upon what, what theme will be exciting to my players, or maybe exciting to me, in which case you have to find the players, uh, the, figure out what type of players will be interested in, 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 in your theme, uh, and what, what aspects of the game really lead into that theme, and making sure that every element of the game contributes to that theme. So everything needs to work together to contribute to the, the player experience. Now, one of the very first games that, uh, one of the, probably the biggest first hit I made was a game uh, based upon the British television show, The Prisoner, uh, which was playing in the United States about the time that uh, I, I was attending college. And this, this was a, which was a television show that was about a British, secret agent we're, we're never really sure exactly who he was but, but but evidence seems to be that it was a secret agent who resigns from his job and as he's driving home he uh he gets captured and taken away to this remote village where he's held prisoner along with other other prisoners and there are uh the, the people running this place are trying to trying to find out why he resigned and uh and uh, he refuses to tell them and they try every trick in the book 
to go and get him to reveal, reveal why he uh, why he wanted to resign. And it was it was really and the the show is really an allegory about uh, about authoritative regimes, how how the people in power try to control the other people, and 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 try to to get them to obey. And that was a really important uh, theme to me when I was going to college, and I was so impassioned by this television show that I wanted to make a game based upon it. So I, I convinced my, uh, when I graduated from college, the, the people at Edgeware who I, I was developing games for hired me on full time. And if, even though at first they had me developing educational games, I was so impassioned about creating this game, The Prisoner, that uh, based on The Prisoner, that I convinced them to let me do it. And so it was all about, what was driving me is, is all about how do I create the experience of being someone who feels in prison and is constantly being manipulated and trying to, uh, and, and, and people are trying to get information from me and I'm refusing and trying to assert my individuality by refu refusing to follow the rules. Uh, but still, you're always knocked back to square one. You're always, you never seem to be making pro progress. Uh, you always seem to lose at the end because you're always a you're always a prisoner in this place. How do you do that without while while still pe keeping the player engaged? And so, uh, so what I did was all I did was I would create a series of of modules that formed episodes. That was all each one had some kind of theme associated to it, some some story theme related to being an indiv individual, and. Uh, I just I just sat down and designed as I was programming. Uh, I, I was I was just hit by inspiration. I, I I didn't create a game design document. I didn't know where I was headed. I was just designed as I was programming, created all these different scenarios about how uh, you were trying to be tricked into getting reveal into revealing why you did de you des uh, resign. And my conceit in the game is that I gave the player a randomly generated number that I, that I told the player, this is your reason for designing. It's a code number. Whatever you do, never reveal this code number to anyone, which means in no case during the game, do you ever type in that number? Do you ever make a selection that has that number in it? And so I was constantly trying to trick the, the player into getting to them to reveal this number by accident. And, and probably the uh, most distinct uh, uh, feature I put in this game uh, behind that was where I tricked the player into thinking the game had encountered an error. And so what would happen as you're playing a game at some point, it would uh, say game error. It would, it would appear to take you out to the operating system and would say game error at line number. And that line number game was actually a resignation code. And if the player did what a normal, normal Apple II player would do at that point is type in list line number and type in that number, you would lose the game. Uh, so uh, it was, uh, it was, I, I really didn't follow any any sort of normal game design rules at the time. It, it was a text adventure game, but uh, I wasn't following any standard. I've been a big Dungeons and Dragons player and played a lot of board games beforehand. So I knew about all the different conceits about game mechanics and, and how things normally work. Here I broke all the different rules because I wanted to create an experience where you had to deal with a place where you couldn't follow all the rules. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's kind of uh, that, and that as a result, that game became a, a big hit at the time. Uh, and uh, that uh, the only thing I have from it right now I, is I, I still have a poster from it. Let's see if this even shows up. No, it, it, my virtual background is making me disappear. It's a poster from my game, The Prisoner Two. Uh, still one of my probably my greatest uh, uh, proudest creative achievement to it. Uh, and as you start your own journey as a game designer, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll find yourself tending to follow these first steps. Probably when you start off as, game design, as, a, as a game designer, you're probably going to start off more as a consumer of games because very few people become game designers without first, first, being, uh, first being exposed to games. So you're going to play a lot of games. And you're... Uh, your first 
your first inclination then is going to make games that are very similar to the games that you played before. Now, I, I teach game design now, and most of my students tend to make games that are just like the platformers they played, if they're making board games in my analog game class, they'll, they'll tend to make games that are very similar to the board games they take. So they'll tend to be very imitative, imitative of what they know. Then they go to the, the, the next step, which is the tinkerer, where they'll start to take little risks. They'll start tinkering around with the game rules and make them a little bit different and adapting them toward the experience they want to create. And then when they get a little bit better than that, they may start to become what's called the masher, is where they may take together games of different genres and combine them together. So maybe a platformer combined with a first-person shooter or, a, uh, or a, uh, a puzzle game combined with a uh, maybe a, a rhythm game. Combine those two together to come up with something unique. Always a tricky thing in mashing games together. To do that successfully, you really need to understand what works in each type of, of game genre and what you can take from what works, how do you combine them in, in the right way to create the right game experience. So uh, a lot of people early on, early on in their game design uh, 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 careers may try mashing together and often it's not successful. It actually, you have to be pretty skilled to mash together diff different game genres very well. And eventually you get to, uh, to a true creator role as a game designer where you start to create something new. So kind of the typical game design journey for most people was from consumer to tinkerer to masher to creator. I didn't come up with these terms. I got a, I got to uh, uh, got to uh, credit another game designer, Till Fristo, for coming up with uh, for, for for coming up with this this uh, game designer's journey. But but I really liked it, and so I apply it a lot myself when I when I talk to my own students about game design and the journey they're going to take. So anyway, I I saw this point myself as a creator and, and, and breaking all the rules and really kind of figuring out rather than starting off with the game mechanics, rather than saying, I'm going to create a play a, a platformer and platforming games, the mechanics are all about running and jumping. So I'm going to create a running and jumping game. My approach is different. My approach is to go and figure out what's my experience and then figuring out what game mechanics do I put in that contribute to that experience. So experience first, not mechanics, is where you want to go if you want to create really unique games. And I thought that my own game, The Prisoner, was so unique uh, that it would inspire uh, uh, other game designers to start creating very, very unique games. And unfortunately, I was disappointed. Uh, I actually saw in the game industry, industry the opposite taking place. I saw a lot of platformers, and I saw a lot of a lot of uh, as first-person shooters and real-time strategy games involved. They started to get very codified into what those were and what fun features they had, and so I saw a lot of games imitating each other. Uh, and especially as games got bigger and bigger and bigger, and they got more and more bigger and bigger budgets, and publishers who put in all that kind of money were afraid to take risks to it they were uh, they were less likely to to want to do something unique i saw uh I, I didn't see a lot of creativity in game development until uh until valve came along and put out steam and really allowed indie games to take place where where, where people game developers could get to, get together and not create the games that publishers wanted them to make, but could follow their own creative instincts and create the, the, the type of games they wanted to make and publish them through Steam, uh, where uh, instead of having to go through a board of people that uh, they had to review things. And uh, usually when I'm looking for creativity, it's through indie game movement that I look at uh, for it. So uh, that's where I find a lot of people that are really focused on uh, do it, figuring out interesting player experiences and interesting ways to deliver on that experience uh, through indie game, uh, indie gamers. Uh, so yeah, focus on the, on the player experience, but uh, you know, that, that a lot of that's coming up with 
a good idea for you want for your game. But being a game designer isn't simply about uh, just coming up with cool ideas. Uh, there are a lot of people I, I meet who want to break into the ga game industry. And what they're looking for is a job where they do nothing but come up with all these great ideas and look for someone else to implement them. In fact, probably the, the, the question I'm asked most for people is, how do I go about submitting my idea to a game development studio to get them to implement? And the fact is that as, for any of you, in uh, fact, all of you out there are own game developers. You already know you got plenty of ideas. You, you're not looking for, for people to implement your, to give you ideas. What people are really looking for are people who can implement ideas. And in order to take ideas and to develop them into really workable design, uh, designs, you really need to uh, know how to implement them. Uh, any type of product development, the idea is only a small part of it. It's really the quality of the implementation is all that matters. So in order to be able to implement things, you really you need to make sure that you have very well developed skills. Now, when I first started in my first game development job, I found that I was a I was a graduate, freshly minted graduate with a with a computer science design degree. But uh, in my first year in game development full time, I was working on things way beyond anything I ever learned in college. I had to create for my company a 2D graphics engine uh, that, would, that could be used throughout all the games written in assembly language. Uh, for my prisoner game, I created a random number generator, a random maze generator that used recursion to randomly generate mazes. I came up with an extra language parser because a big part of my game was was conversing with the people that, that ran the place. And so you would go and you'd type in uh, in full sentences what you had to say, and the, and the uh, uh, computer had to interpret that and come up with interesting responses. So uh, uh, creating my own uh, artificial intelligence routines. Uh, none of that, well, maybe a little tiny bit. But most of it I never learned in college. I had to learn on my own, and that required uh, uh, really developing my skills and reading a lot of uh, books on AI uh, and uh, and figure and and reading uh, uh, you know how the how the graphics in the computer works so I could create uh, a graphics engine for our games. Now uh, back in those days, the programmer and the designer were the same person. That was my role. So uh, uh, so I, I had I had to know a lot about programming. But even these days, where the design and the programmer probably is not the same person. It still helps for you as a game designer to know a little bit about programming. In fact, you should know a little bit about every position there is on the game development team. You should know a little bit about programming uh, and maybe, and certainly should know how to do scripting. Uh, if you're, if you, you, you start your career as a designer, uh, being a level designer, you're certainly going to need to know scripting to implement your level design, but you should know some scripting. You should know a little bit about art, and uh, you should know a little bit about audio and music, and how art and music can be used to create the experience. Remember, it's all about creating the experience your players want. So how does, how does art and music, how do they create the right mood you want? What are the different styles of art and music out there? Uh, how do they create the pacing? How can they be used to create effect to contribute to your story? You need, as a game designer, need to know that so you can properly talk to the artists and talk to the audio people, the, the music composers or the sound effects people and speak to them in their language because different people on the team, they have different outlooks, they have different perspectives they even have different vocabulary, and you need to speak the way they do in order to properly communicate your, your design to them. And you certainly need to know how to talk to the programmer because a programmer is going to be the person who's going to be implementing all your game rules. So you got need to under, make sure that they understand what it is that, that you want the game to do, and that requires properly communicating with the programmer. So main skill 
is in in game design i would say is communication because you are communicating with your team constantly you lay out what you may describe how you game your game wanted to be but unless they the rest of your team understands it uh, they're not going to implement it properly you need to be able to communicate with your management to convince them that this game that you're making is going to be cool and why it's going to be cool that you need to be able to talk to the marketing and sales people to communicate to them why your game is going to be fun and engaging and different from other people's games so that they can go and communicate that through all, all of their uh, promotional materials. You need to finally be able to talk to communicate with your players because your job as a game designer, most of our job is to communicate how to play your game to your players. Now that may involve writing instruction manuals, but as we all know, gamers do not like to read, they like to get into it. So it's communicating also through your tutorials or in creating that initial experience where you layer on rule after rule, you start off very simple and you create the experiences where the players learn how to play the game from playing the game. You have to communicate your rules, whether it is through a tutorial, whether it is through a manual, or where it is through that initial level in your game, how to play your game. So developing good communication schools, written communication skills, uh, oral communication skills is the number one, one skill for you as a game designer going into it. Um, and unfortunately, you're not always gonna be successful. Uh, one thing that I learned, uh, early on is that failure is very common. Not every game that you make is gonna be a big hit. Uh, you're gonna, and not every game you make is going to sell well. You could have a great game, but if it isn't promoted properly, it's not gonna sell well. Uh, and even if you think you're doing a great job uh, where things outside your can your con, uh, control uh, can uh, can still your, your your company could still uh, falter. Uh, when I worked at Edgeware for five years, and we were pretty successful. Uh, we 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 eventually when I started there were, we were four people working out of an apartment, and eventually we got into an office building. And after about five years, we were like 120 people. But then we reached a point where we couldn't grow any further. Uh, and so uh, there was a, a, a company, a larger company based in Atlanta, Georgia, excuse me, Atlanta, Georgia, that was, uh, they were an accounting software firm and they wanted to break into the uh, home market. And they thought the best way to do that was to buy a company that was already in the home market. Uh, so uh, we were selling educational and entertainment software for the home. So they bought us out. And unfortunately, within a year, they uh, they drove us into the the ground. That is, uh, uh, our our sales went to zero because they went and they they marketed all of our games and our entertainment software like it was accounting software, all in the same packaging as their accounting software. They didn't know how to how to uh, uh, create ads that were exciting to the home user, and so uh, our our company. Uh, after they bought us, they drove our company out of business after a year. So even though uh, I had enjoyed success for, for five years, suddenly here I was without a company. Uh, so what happened then, a group of us, people from Edgeware, we decided, well, we, we were successful with Edgeware, let's create our own, own company. And so uh, we got together and we created a, uh, a, uh, our, uh, created a company called Electric Transit where we focused on creating 3D simulations that uh, taught people about interesting things. Our first game was a game called Wilderness. Oh, what's the virtual background strikes again called Wilderness. Let me put it in front of me. Oh, that works out. Wilderness a Survival Adventure, uh, which was a, uh, a 3D game that was one of the very first uh, real-time 3D games created for the Apple II. And it was all about surviving in the wilderness after your plane crash lands. And, uh, and uh, you learned real survival tips while learning the, the game. And uh, 
uh, one of my business partners was a uh, was a NASA JPL scientist who uh, who liked uh, video game development as a hobby, uh, and he had when I was at Edgeware he had, he had worked with us uh, creating a, a space shuttle simulation. So he became one of my business partners, and uh, uh, he was a primary developer of this game, and I, I contributed some of the artwork and the programming to it. But uh, it, it was. It was, it was a game that got great reviews, but our problem being a very small company is that we didn't have good distribution. And so, uh, and uh, it, was, it was a time where there, were, there weren't big stores like, like Walmart or, uh, or uh, Blockbuster to sell your games through. Rather, there was a whole bunch of very, very small stores. Uh, in the United States, there were like thousands of these small stores that each had to be individually contacted uh, to sell our games to so that they could go and sell them to the actual consumers. And we were just a small company of four people. We didn't have the, the, uh, the, the manpower to go in and contact all these stores. So there was another company that started up just a couple years before we did that actually was a much larger company, much better funded, and they actually had a very good distribution network. And that company, you may have heard of it before. It's called Electronic Arts, or EA, uh, started by Trip Hawkins. And, uh, and yeah, they, they started only a couple years before us, but they were much bigger. And so we entered into a deal with them to uh, sell our, uh, to, uh, to, to distribute our products to stores. And uh, at first, it was we were the, we were actually their very first affiliated label publisher. They had a, that's that's what they called the program, the affiliated label program, where they took uh, games published by other small publishers and and, and distributed distributed them, them themselves. Uh, and uh, you know, just unfortunately, uh, that let we because we were their first affiliated label publisher, we uh, they also made their first mistakes on us. We had, uh, in response to their projections, we had just, we had just manufactured 5,000 copies of, uh, of Wilderness. And, you know, that cost us money just manufacturing them. So we call up, uh, we call up electron, Electronic Arts and told them, all right, the, the next 5,000 units, we just shipped them. They're on your way to you. you. They'll arrive in a few days. And they said, hold on a second. We made an error in our sales projections, and we overestimated the demand for your game. So not only are we, uh, we're not going to pay you for the 5,000 you just shipped to us. We're going to go, we're going to hold on to them. And we're going to hold on to them until you buy back the last 5,000 you shipped from us because we, are, we over ordered. And unfortunately, because they were much bigger than us, we didn't have much of a choice. We were forced to buy back uh, 5,000 we had previously made, in addition to not being able to sell to them the 5,000 we just made. And that eventually we got into a, uh, a, a financial hole that we can never get out of. And so, uh, so that, that, was, that was a hard lesson. And uh, and despite uh, the games we made getting good reviews, we were out of business after a couple of years. So one thing that I learned is that, uh, you know, success doesn't come easily in the game industry. You're probably going to encounter more failures than you will successes. Uh, Rovio, which I believe is based in Finland, they made 51 games. Before uh, and they were they mostly did it as uh, they made some on their own. They made uh, some for other game uh, other game publishers. Uh, they were con they did some on contract, but they were they were eventually they were about on the verge of going out of business, and they decided to make one more game. And so they had an artist sit down and sketch out ideas, and one of the ideas he sketched out was a bird. Not a happy bird, but an angry bird. And so uh, they decided to make this one more game based upon these angry birds. And you all know what a success that was. Uh, so you, you, can't, you can't get bitter by your, you can't get discouraged by your failures. You can't get bitter from them. Uh, 
you, you just got to keep plugging away at it. Uh, game industry is really hard, uh, but you know, if you're, you're passionate about what you do, you got to keep plugging away because you know, you never know where that one success after all those other failures will be more than worth, uh, worth, uh, worth uh, all the all, all the hardships you've gone through before, and probably all the hardships that you're going to go to afterwards. A lot of game companies are going to have that one big success, but then the next few games they put out are not going to be that successful. Uh, so you know that's that's kind of the ebb and flow of game design. Another thing you need to realize is that you're not always going to be a uh, you're not always going to do the type of games you want to do. I, t I tell a lot of people. Uh, who want to break into the game industry that you're not going to be a, a, a you're not going to be like a fine artist. It's going to be much more like being a commercial artist. Uh, and so uh, you're, uh, uh, you're, you're mostly not going to be working on your ideas. You're going to be working on other people's ideas. And, uh, and so uh, you're going to find yourself working on a lot of sequels and working for other clients. Uh, I worked at my, after after Electronic Arts folded. Uh, got to work on a, uh, uh, got to work at the Walt Disney Company, where I mostly made adaptations of uh, of, uh, of uh, Disney television shows and uh, and uh, and movies. And got up my, my my biggest game at that time was Ducktales. Uh, a lot of your game is going to be working on. Uh, uh, other adaptations, uh, one of my biggest successes was I Have No Mouth and I'm a Scream, where I worked with uh, Harlan Ellison on adapting his short story on it, uh, his short story in a video game. And uh, because a lot of your idea, a lot of the things you're going to be working on are not going to be your own ideas, you have to, you have to really get enjoyment out of the process of game design. Uh, and, and find the fun for yourself and the challenge for yourself and working on other people's ideas. In fact, uh, a lot of your work may be in developing games for other clients or your, the ideas are going to be working on uh, ideas for, uh, uh, that come from your bosses. Uh, so, uh, so get, uh, so you're not, yeah, I have game design ideas that I've been holding on to for 30 years and never got a chance to develop. Uh, most of my work had been developing other people's ideas, but I enjoy doing that. So, so find, find the fun in, 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 in getting, uh, in doing other people's ideas. And in fact, uh, that leads me on to probably game you want to hear about most heroes of might magic, uh, three, uh, which was a sequel. I, when I was, uh, how I got brought into that was that, uh, I was working at, uh, uh, Cyber Dreams, where I made uh, here, uh, I have no math, I must scream. And even though our games were reviewed well, the owner of the company wasn't doing as well in that company as he was with some of his other uh, uh, companies. And so uh, he decided to, uh, to shut us down. And so uh, uh, trying to figure out what to do, uh, I got a phone call from a programmer that used to work at Cyber Dreams, and he said he was working at 3DO, uh, 3DO's New World Computing Division, and they were working on the Heroes of Mind Magic series and were looking for a producer and uh, thought that I would be good in the role. Uh, so, uh, so he asked me to send him his resume and we bring on to his bosses. And uh, his bosses brought me in. And one of his bosses was John Van Canaham who was the president of the company. Now I had met John Van Canaham five years earlier at a, uh, at a game design panel at the game developers conference. And after the panel, we said, after the panel, uh, we said we, we should work with each other one day. Well, here it is five years later, this was a day. Uh, and uh, we met and I met with the general manager and they thought I was a good person to bring on. And, uh, there was uh, one more hurdle to overcome with it. I had to talk to the president of the of the company, and uh, and that pre the president of the company was Trip Hawkins, the founder of Electronic Arts, the same company that drove my earlier company out of business. Well, you know what? You can't have hardship. You can't have hard feelings in the game industry. 
So I went in and had my uh, phone call with him. It was very pleasant. Uh, we actually had a two hour phone call where he interviewed me. And I think in that entire phone call, he asked me maybe three questions. He mostly talked about himself and, uh, and how, uh, what a great company 3DO was. And, uh, and uh, so he welcomed me aboard. And uh, the, the lesson that I learned from all that is never badmouth anybody, no matter what happens, you know, even if you do have a, a bad working relationship with each other, you never know when you're going to be working with them again. And, uh, and uh, just maintain your relationships. Always be a person that you want other, that other people want to work with. If that one programmer hadn't, hadn't liked working under me at, at Cyber Dreams, he would never have suggested that I work in the world computing and I would have never worked on the Heroes of Mind Magic series. So Heroes of Mind Magic, uh, when, when I got hired to do that, they, before they, I actually started, they asked me to play Heroes of Mind Magic too. So I played this, played, played the game and it was a great game. In fact, it had been called one of the greatest games ever made, one of the greatest turn-based strategy games ever made. Um, and so, uh, so I thought, how, how do you improve on this? There's no place to go on but down, except for one area. I thought the graphics could be improved. And so, uh, and so I, I brought in the, uh, so I decided what I would do, my, my big contribution with that is to bring, I thought the graphics were five years behind the time. So I thought I would make them more state of the art. And the way I thought about doing that, whereas the, the Heroes 2 magics were more fanciful, I wanted to create graphics that were more edgier. And I called them extreme fantasy. And I use as my inspiration, Warhammer. And uh, fortunately, people at New World uh, uh, agreed with me on that. And uh, so did the game designer they brought in. Uh, Greg Fulton, who was who was hired the same day I was, brought in the same day. In fact, he was the one who brought my attention to Warhammer when I talked about Extreme Fantasy. And so we worked together, uh, but I wasn't given much of a team. And so a, a lot a lot of my work was in building up the right team. Um, and so uh, uh, I, I we did, I had to bring in a lot of my own people. I brought in. Uh, uh, programmers who worked on I have no mouth and I have a scream. I had to bring in, uh, I go through the art department and I, I interviewed all the different artists there. And I tried to find the artist who was least happy. That is who thought that everyone could be doing a much better job. And so uh, I found that in Phelan Sykes and asked her to be the art director on the project. Turned out she was also the best artist on the team. And when people ask me why Heroes of uh, My Magic Theory was so successful, my answer is always the same. It was the team. It was all about the teamwork behind it. Uh, game development is a team sport. And if your number one skill as a game designer is in teamwork, the, the uh, sorry, in communications, the next is being a good team player. And the reason why that game turned out so well is that uh, is that uh, uh, everyone worked well together as a team and everyone really meshed together. We had a very clear vision for it. And my job as the director of that team was to make sure everyone was on board with that vision. We followed that vision all the way throughout it. Um, another, another reason why Heroes 3 we thought was so successful is that we really worked on the balancing of that game. Uh, we, uh, Greg Fulton and John McCannum got together, and before we implemented anything in the game, they balanced all the creatures together on spreadsheets. They created in Excel all the uh, all the combat rules, and they would pit each each creature against each other, until they made sure that there was a whole bunch of different meaningful choices that players could have about different creatures to put up against each other. Each one had different abilities, but we had to make sure that each creature of a given level was comparable, had, had roughly equal chances of beating each other uh, in a kind of a rock, paper, scissors kind of fashion with each other. We also wanted to, to take a balance of different player skills. In Heroes of Mind Magic, it's equal part strategy and equal part storytelling. And so we made sure that, that the maps we created uh, 
appeal to both players who like the storytelling and players who like the strategy. And then finally, we would play test things over and over and over again um, to make sure everything worked well. We had to be very open-minded about anything that our playtesting said wasn't working right. One thing as a game designer is you never should get too attached to your ideas, no matter how great you think you are. An idea isn't good until you've actually playtested it and your players tell you that the idea is good. So you should be playtesting very early on your, in your game before it gets too late to, to, to change anything. Uh, and verify all of your assumptions that what you think is going to be fun, will be fun, is actually fun. Um, uh, so uh, it was all about the teamwork and all about the balance thing. Uh, unfortunately, I see we're close to running out of time. We got a little bit of a late start. I actually meant to cover a whole bunch more, but uh, I hope you like. I'm glad I was able to end at least on Heroes of My Magic Three. I wanted to to tell a couple of announcements and. This is the first time I'm, I'm revealing this publicly, and that is tomorrow I'm starting a new job. I'm going to be producer on a uh, new virtual world called Cinema World or Cinema World, which is going to be an online virtual world that's all about international travel and international culture. And so you're going to travel around to different cities and experience art museums and film and uh, and fashion and music and plays and, and 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 in that world get experience the world of culture and learn about different types of culture. Now, being I like traveling a lot myself. I like experiencing different cultures. Uh, last year, I, I I was lucky enough to be invited by Wargaming.net to to Minsk and got to uh, meet a lot of nice people throughout, from, throughout Belarus. Uh, hope to visit again uh, sometime, but I've always loved international travel. And so I'm gonna finally create a game that's gonna be based upon that. Kind of very different from a lot of the other things I made before, but again, you should always, as a game designer, never be afraid to tackle something new. Another announcement I wanna have is that Greg Fulton, the lead designer of Heroes of Mind Magic 3, is working on a game that he calls a Heroes 3 spiritual successor. He is created, uh, right now developing a game based upon um, uh, that has a lot of similarities to Heroes of Mind Magic 3, uh, using everything that he learned from making that game. Uh, he's still in the early stages right now. He uh, he uh, he doesn't have, <laughs> unfortunately doesn't have a website up yet, isn't active on social media yet. So that, that's something I told him. You got to be, you got to put yourself out there. Marketing is a key thing. I was just talking to him yesterday about that. So for right now, if you, if you're interested in that game and want to follow the, follow the progress on it, uh, you can follow my social media channels. You can follow me on Twitter, David underscore Mullick. You can uh, make Facebook friends with me, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram. Um, I, I took a break from Twitter for about a year, but, but I'm getting back on it again. If you want to follow me, you'll learn everything uh, you want to learn about uh, uh, we're, we're, uh, well, the work that Greg is doing on the Heroes Team uh, Spiritual Successor. So uh, uh, until he gets his own social media up and going, I'll, I'll, share, I'll be glad to share progress about that as well as some of the things that I'm working on. All right, uh, I thought I'd end here. <laughs> If anyone has any, any questions, be happy to answer them for you. Hey, David, uh, it's Igor here back. Thank you so much for such a great, such an inspirational talk. I love it. I almost felt like I'm sitting uh, next to like, you know, uh, a fire or a hut and you're telling a story. And I feel everyone in the chat is feeling the same. Well, I hope it was an interesting story. Uh, yeah, I love storytelling, which is why I decided to do it as stories instead of a instead of a, a boring PowerPoint lecture. So I, I hope I made the right choice here. Absolutely right. Yeah, and thanks a lot for such an honor to share the details about your new role and you and your new position. Uh, this is so great. Nobody has done uh, such the things before on WN Hub and on Talents and Games Online. And I'm so happy that you're um, like the first one who is doing this. And I'm also looking forward to see the next spiritual 
game after the Heroes 3 uh, your colleague is making. Uh, this is such the wonderful news. Great, great. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to share the new, share even more news about it as it gets further developed. Thanks. And uh, just to let you know, uh, the live chat on the platform is boiling with the questions, comments, thumbs up, uh, grateful words. People are very happy that uh, they have a chance to listen to you and watch uh, you giving this talk lively. Thanks. So I would say we have uh, something like lots of questions. And as long as you are very open to just talk a bit on social media, maybe like on Twitter, or Facebook, or LinkedIn or something. Um, I would ask uh, maybe three questions from uh, like all the uh, all the, the like super large number we have. Uh, all right. Terrific! I'd be glad to answer them. Thanks. So um, I would pick like three the most interesting and the ones sorry guys like like the ones i like i'm sure um, they're all interesting yeah they're they're all like uh, about uh not just uh like the details of development uh of this or that game but uh everybody um is looking to learn your point of view on this or that topic or like for example um the guy in the chat asks us, um, should a game designer like uh, or a game studio probably uh, do as many simple games uh, as they can until they feel comfortable about starting developing complex game? Or should they get their hands on a complex game right away and get more tense and interesting experience? Should the game developer, uh, as an ex unexperienced one, try to reach uh, for the stars right here, right now? or uh, like should um, go little by little. How do you feel about that? Well, I think you can learn from both working on uh, lots of small games as well as one large game. I think you know, whatever approach you take, it's really important to get your, your work in the hands of other people soon so you can get good feedback on it. It's never too early to begin playtesting on your game. And, and don't be afraid of people telling you what's wrong with your game. That's how you learn. So, and, and pe people are never wrong. If they're playing your game and they say it's not fun, guess what? It's not fun. If they don't understand it, they're right. That's not, they don't understand it. If it's, they say it's too hard or it's too easy, and most initial game designers, most starting out, tend to make their games too hard uh, rather than too easy. Uh, but if, if your players say it's too hard or too easy, they're right. It's too hard or too easy for them. So uh, wh whatever you're doing, whether it's a, a bunch of small games or, or one large one, get it out. Get something playable as quickly as you can. And then as soon as you have something playable, get it into the hands of other people and, and uh, get them to play it and find out what they think about it and then go back and refine it thank you so um it it, um, it sounds like um the hyper casual games approach uh is something uh, close to the truth because like one of the main principles of uh, this game genre is iterate prototype uh, as, as as much as you can write yes it is uh but you can even do that with a large game certainly if you're working with a lot if you're learning, what you can do is learn about game design by taking an existing game and creating mods for it uh, or creating mm -hmm. levels for it. And, and you know, that's a good way to go and ask people, what do you think about the change I made to this particular game? And, and, and figure out if they say it worked, why did it work? If it, uh, if it didn't work, try to figure out why it didn't work. So I, I think you can learn from either. Uh, it's just that make sure that you're that you're still taking small steps between getting feedback, because because the more you try to do and then you get feedback on, it's kind of hard to isolate what worked right and what what worked wrong. Make small changes and then get feedback to your game. Yep. Thank you. Um, so the next question, which is like coming from uh, the previous one, is. Um, 
in compare how much percent you dedicate to doing things, how much time you should spend thinking about things and uh, planning things. I, my own preference is to implement stuff as quickly as possible, because as you're implementing stuff, that will improve your thinking about making games. It's one thing to think about a game without just in your head. In fact, even if you can't program it, implement it as a paper prototype and start playing it. Uh, test out the validity of your thinking. And again, as you as you implement it, you're 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 going to clarify your thinking a lot more. So I'm 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 a I'm a big believer in in in, in implementation as a part of brainstorming. Thanks. Sounds great. So um, the last question uh, for today would be, uh, it's very temporary, I would say. So um, there is a problem. Um, how to maintain uh, your gamers in the game? And especially when it comes to mobile gaming, when you have only five minutes to tell a story. What's your opinion on that? Uh, how to um, drag and maintain people in a mobile game um, with some narrative moves or something. Do you have any ideas on that? Well, it really, a lot depends on, on, on determining ahead of time what's going to make your game fun. Uh, figure out what, what the fun is for the player in that game and make sure you're delivering in on the fun. Now you have, in a, in a short game, you, you only have a limited amount of time to deliver that fun. Uh, and actually, I would think that in a short period of time, it's a lot easier. What you have to do is make sure that the player has a clear goal. And when they take an action in the game that brings them closer to the, to the goal, make sure, make sure that you reward them somehow for, for, for taking that correct action. And usually, and by rewarding them, it's not just giving them points or, uh, or giving them a virtual good. The action itself has to be fun to do. It's got to be appeal, appeal to their, their, their skill level or uh, you know, uh, re, be fun in terms of the story elements it appeals. I think that actually in a short game, your hardest part is going to be get, letting the player know that there's going to be more fun the next time they come. So maybe kind of dangling little hints about what lies ahead for when they come back to your game so that they do indeed come back. Thank you very much, David. Um, so guys who have uh, some unanswered questions in the chat, please um, reach out to David on his social media. You can find them easily. Um, David. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for answering the questions and for the announcement. It was such a pleasure for me and for the entire Talents and Games Online conference team as well. Great. I enjoyed talking with you all and everyone stay safe and uh, game on. <laughs>